From Imperial College London, welcome to this special lecture vodcast. I am hoping that I am wired, connected, but what actually matters to me is to be connected to the audience here in this room, although I know that a record's being made. Um, and uh, unlike uh, many lecturers in this room, I'm not using anything very high-tech, mainly your ears, as a matter of fact. Uh, well, you may think they're very high-tech, uh, but I am using one or two other things, and what I'm hoping is that uh, there is a little handout um, which has been made available, but I also put one or two key passages of text, and even, very daring for a philosopher, a couple of pretty pictures. Um, so that is what I'm, the way I'm hoping that it will work. Um, now the work that I'm going to be talking about is based on a book that I have coming out together with my co-author Neil Manson and we're very grateful to the Wellcome Trust who funded Neil for three years so that we could write this book together. We're even more grateful to, to them for taking a very serious interest in the topic and in the possibility of rethinking the received views on which both medical ethics and research on human subjects is taken to be based. So um, uh, we think this work has quite a lot of practical import and uh, what I'm going to do today is to tell you a bit about the present situation. How did we get where we are? Secondly, what are the problems of the present situation? And I think they are grave problems. And then more adventurously, to sketch for you an alternative and we think better grounded view of what informed consent can and can't do. And finally, some of its practical implications and policy implications. So it's a big menu and I hope that we can also have fun discussing it. Now, as you all know, informed consent is seen as quite fundamental to medical ethics and to research ethics whenever human subjects are used. But, and this is perhaps surprising to us, this has not always been the case. Now you can say, well that was because in the past they were benighted and now we are enlightened and we know about human rights and we know how important informed consent is. But I think it is quite interesting to trace a little bit of the micro-history of how informed consent came to be important in our lives. And the, f the first exhibit is the Nuremberg Code of 1947, which you'll see on the handout, a little extract from it. It was written by doctors, and the doctors were helping the prosecution at the Nuremberg trials. So this is a very important moment in the whole history of research on human subjects. And the code was meant to help the prosecution by setting out some of the distinctions between acceptable research on human subjects and unacceptable abusive research on human subjects. Curiously, the document has no determinate legal status, but it is always regarded as one of the landmarks which we need to think about when we're thinking about research on human subjects. And I actually think that more, the more you think about it, the more you see that it was quite an astute piece of drafting. Now, long after 1947, beginning in the 1960s and going into the 1970s, I'll come back to the document in a moment, uh, consent requirements were extended from research on human subjects to clinical contexts. And much more recently, they have been extended from clinical contexts to procedures regulating the acquisition, the possession, and the use of personal information, including medical and especially genetic information about human individuals. Now, the Nuremberg Code, and I'm hoping that here I can put the key element of it up for you, 
Uh, can you switch it on? Five. Put it. <laughs> so, um, it, it's on your uh, handout, but I think it's sometimes easier to see what the salient things that are going on here are, having it up, it up like that. The voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. Then it glosses what it is meant by voluntary consent. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice, and then what I think is the key phrase, without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, a legal term that I hope you will not ask me to define, or ulterior forms of constraint and coercion and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter to make an, enlightened, an understanding and enlightened decision. Then it talks a bit about telling the experimental subject something about the nature, duration, and purpose of the experiment, how it's going to be done, and what particular inconveniences or hazards he may expect. If now you can see here that the emphasis is on capacities and on the situation of the person on whom research is done. In saying that the research subject should have the legal capacity, be so situated as to choose, the sorts of things that the drafters had in mind was that the person was not a child or not uh, suffering from dementia or uh, extreme frailty and again, that they were not in a position for duress to be exercised. For example, they were not a prisoner. And that, of course, in the context of the Nazi experiments of the 1930s and the 1940s, is an absolutely key thing, that these were coercively inflicted experiments. So, then, that established the potential research subject has to be told about the experiment and about its effects on him or her. So there's a limited view of the information to be imparted and nothing is said about procedures for giving consent or for seeking consent. It is clear indeed when you look at it that implied consent need not violate the Nuremberg criteria. Now codes generally don't do justifications but Nuremberg is very unusual in that it makes it rather clear what the point of these provisions is. And the point of the provisions is that there shouldn't be that element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, etc. Consent, in short, is needed to ensure against violation of certain well-accepted underlying legal and ethical prohibitions. The point of consent is quite clear. Now, things have moved a very long way since Nuremberg. Informed consent requirements today as usually drafted or implemented, have much wider scope, they set much more exacting requirements, and they're commonly justified in quite different ways. To illustrate where we are today, I turn to a second landmark document, which is the 2004 um, the 2004 version of the Declaration of Helsinki. This is another document drafted by uh, doctors. Uh, the sponsors are the World Medical Association. And it is what you might call a rolling document updated every um, you know, five or 10 years. It was originally drafted in 1964, and the most recent version dates to 2004. And again, it's a landmark document taken as standard setting for research on human subjects. And the relevant articles read, as you have them there, I've picked out the two most relevant, and please note that uh, the word informed and information, I've uh, highlighted these, they are not highlighted in the document, but I think it's one of the very interesting developments between Nuremberg and Helsinki that information is highlighted in this way. And boy, is it highlighted. 
In any research on human beings, each potential subject must be adequately informed of the aims, methods, sources of funding, possible conflicts of interest, institutional affiliations of the researcher, anticipated benefits, potential risks and discomfort. It's quite a mouthful. And so informing uh, this, the uh, potential research subjects about the, de uh, um, the design of the research, the sources of funding and its purposes may be extremely complicated. Then I think not so controversial, the right to withdraw consent without reprisal is very important. That, after all, would be duress. Then, the researcher, only as you notice, the document says that it's the physician. And one of the very interesting things about this landmark document is that it's absolutely careless about confusing researchers and physicians. But uh, let's assume tactfully that it's the researcher. Um, after ensuring the subject has understood the information, you ensure that someone else has understood it, then you obtain the subject's freely given informed consent, preferably in writing. That, of course, was not mentioned at all in the uh, Nuremberg Declaration. And if the consent can't be obtained in writing, the non-written consent must be formally documented and witnessed. And I'm sure many of you in this room have met those procedures or participated in those procedures. So there are several changes here. Most obviously that em emphasis on many categories of information, but also this new emphasis on process. The physician has to get or uh, follow a procedure and get it witnessed. And ostensibly, as it is generally seen, standards have been raised. But I think the Helsinki Declaration, for obvious reasons, doesn't make evident the most striking changes in discussions of informed consent in biomedicine across these 50 years, which is the approach usually taken to justification. Whereas Nuremberg <coughs> emphasizes the importance of not violating certain underlying obligations, the typically con typical contemporary justification of informed consent requirements is just that consent is needed to respect individual autonomy. That's such a cliche of our times, we hardly notice what it might mean or, mean or how it's in ambiguous. Informed consent, it's argued, ensures that patients and research subjects can decide autonomously whether to permit or refuse actions that affect them. Now in this lecture, I shall comment on these standard accounts of, in, of consent transactions, then suggest an alternative and I hope more plausible way of thinking about them and the justifications and the standards they can meet. Let me now turn to current problems. The problems are, I fear, pretty acute. Now it's uncontroversial that current conceptions of informed consent create many problems for us. What if patients and research subjects consent without reading or without understanding the informed dissent, uh, consent disclosures made to them? And it's absolutely clear that they do this a great deal. Social sciences have, scientists have tracked this and it's clear that there is massive non-comprehension, inattention and misunderstanding. Um, what if consent disclosures omit certain information? And it's clear not merely that consent disclosures do omit certain information, but that they must omit certain information. I'll come to the arguments. Is consent given on the basis of incomplete disclosures inadequate? Should research be stopped? Should treatment be withheld? Or should we persist with current consent practices in the full knowledge that defective consent might not ensure the autonomy of research subjects or patients and may not justify what's done in medical or research interventions. Neither option is at all appealing. But to give you just a sense of the sheer size of this problem, consider a standard randomized clinical trial for a new drug. And the uh, sort of sociological follow-up of participants in those trials, all of whom have been duly told that it is a randomized trial, have been told that they may or may not get uh, 
something that is uh, a, a drug because they might be getting a placebo and if they do get a drug that it may or may not help their condition and that it might have side effects. They've all been told this and if you go back a month later and you ask uh, why were you in this arm of the trial and the only answer is it, it was randomized assignment so there's no reason. On various uh, after, uh, studies after the event, between 50 and 70% of subjects say, oh, well, my doctor thought it was best for me to be in that arm of the trial. Now, if that tells you one thing, it tells you that they did not understand the method of the uh, research of, of the clinical trial. And that should be an absolute reason for not going ahead if we take the Helsinki standard seriously. Now, equally, it's not at all appealing to say, well, we must uh, lower the standards so that we can live up to them, and then everything will be all right. We don't want to lower the standards either in clinical practice or in research practice. So I think the only option, if one, as it were, attends to what is not achieved at present, namely genuine consent, is to try to rethink the use of informed consent in biomedicine. And there you have the motivation for this sort of work. I suppose uh, there are alternatives. And what I'm going to do is to sketch you with one alternative. But I'm going to begin with some standard comments on the current difficulties. Now, I don't usually like, because it's reckoned bad practice in my sort of discipline, to refer to a whole body of work as the standard position. That's not what we do. We document and we try to be precise about it. But I'm going to refer to a huge body of writing at just as the standard position. And I think in this case I'm justified in doing it. If you get on Medline or some other uh, database, you will discover that there is an absolute torrent of articles published on informed consent. Uh, don't spend very long on it because they're highly repetitive of one another. Uh, but the, it is unending and uh, when you've got uh, six uh, articles per working day with informed consent in the title just in the journals listed on Medline, you begin to think, no, -uh, this is not going to be adequate. So you've got this vast industry, an absolute colossus, with a vast and repetitive literature as its product. Now, in my view, this has happened. It wouldn't, I think, happen in more respectable fields of study, but it happens because those who serve the industry have got an impossible aim. They want to raise the standards for informed consent. And this doesn't work because the way of raising the standards that they approach makes excessive demands on patients and research subjects and so they then look for ways of reducing the demands which nevertheless raise the standards and people are endlessly optimistic. The standard arguments for requiring consent and the standard ways of implementing consent lead to the following problems. In the first place, it is strictly impossible to achieve fully specific consent. You can always add more detail to the consent procedures or the consent forms, but however long the forms, however tedious the explanations, not everything can be included. And there's no way of avoiding some consideration of what should and should not be included. Equally, there's no way of making all consenting explicit. If we are to achieve explicit consent in some cases, you know, the, the written disclosure, the written signed form, we have to rely on implicit consent in others. For example, we cannot seek explicit consent to the use of these or those consent procedures without assuming a prior acceptance of certain standards. Otherwise, one would be embarking on an infinite regress of seeking consent to use certain ways of seeking consent to use certain ways of seeking consent etc. So consent can at best be based on relevant information and accepted procedures and I think it's quite liberating to realize the mythic character of these phrases fully specific and fully explicit consent. <coughs> 
Consent has to be based on selective understanding of a proposal. Well, that's one, as it were, liberating move, but I think the problems lie much deeper. Because very often, if you set out an account of what you think the salient or relevant characteristics of an experiment on human volunteers or of, of a medical intervention, it is impossible to communicate that relevant information to the individuals affected. It's an illusion, in my view, to think that we c there are ways of improving consent procedures that are going to make it possible for all patients or all research subjects to grasp even the outline of very complex clinical interventions or complex research proposals. Of course, patients are very clever and they have a way of short-circuiting the process when they don't understand it. They say, doctor, if it was you or if it was someone in your family, what would you do? And then you say, well, if it was me, I would do this or do that. And thereby they have got, as it were, a, a clue about what answer to give to the thing they don't understand. Of course, it is commonly said that we should use other procedures, for example, we should appeal to the best interest of the patient, when capacities to consent are impaired. But that phrase, impaired capacities, or um, uh, picks out far too narrow a range of potential patients and research subjects to deal with the problem I'm talking about. Once we acknowledge the actual complexity of the relevant information in many cases, we'll realize that if the standard is adequate to convey the information, lots of people with entirely normal cognitive capacities will have to count as impaired because their understanding, and hence their consent, won't measure up to the complexity of the proposed interventions. And one has to deal with that. Now, an alternative and less ambitious account might be more plausible, and I mean by saying alternative, not that we should persist with the enterprise of looking at ways of, quotes, improving consent procedures. That's what the vast literature does. But however hard one tries to make consent disclosures more perspicuous, perspicuous or complete and consent requirements more user-friendly for this or that category of patient or research subject, ultimately it's not going to work. The ameliorative approaches just have limited potential because they don't address the underlying difficulties created by current conceptions of informed consent. Here I begin to get a little bit philosophical, not very. A first step, I believe, in rethinking informed consent is to recognize that it can only be sought and obtained by adequate communicative transactions. Those who request consent must communicate what they propose, and they, and they must commit themselves to act within the terms of any consent given by those whose consent they request. So they must communicate what they propose and that they will then act in a certain way. Equally, those who can give consent must communicate that they grasp what is proposed and that they commit themselves not to view action that meets the terms of their consent as any sort of wrong. So there is communication and <coughs> commitment going both ways. If we are to understand informed consent, we need to think about the sorts of communicative transactions it requires and the standards they must meet. And I've been arguing that really the standards in the normal consent disclosure followed by patient decision model is not very good. I think that this happens because a lot of current accounts of informed consent transactions represents them quite passively simply as information transfer and not as interactive or communicative. Information is seen as located or held in one or another place or by one or another person, say the researcher, and then as flowing to another place or another person from one source or container to another, through one conduit or channel to another. Information seen this way can be disclosed or disseminated, but it may not be received and it may not be grasped and understood. Now these metaphors, very familiar to us from their use in IT, have their uses. They give us a common vocabulary for discussing the transfer of information between people
and t between technological devices or crossing over. But they have their danger because they encourage us to think of information in abstraction from human activity and specifically in abstraction from the speech acts by which we communicate and from the normative framework that those speech acts must meet if they are to succeed. The normative standards and particularly the epistemic standards are simply bracketed in the normal discourse about information in our society. And in the end, as we all know from our daily lives, let alone our professional lives, successful communicative transactions aren't mere transfers of information. They are speech acts by which one party tells others what is proposed and the other says, I do and I don't understand it, and by which one party says, and I commit myself to stick to these uh, particular um, protocols, and the other party says, uh, and I accept that, and if you do, I will regard it as acceptable and not complain. Communication is unlike information transfer. It is more than information transfer because it fails if it is not audience sensitive and indeed doesn't reach audiences. And yet, we have this enormous tendency today to discuss speech acts in terms of these very impersonal metaphors. If you think about informed consent, uh, you find that people often focus very narrowly on the proper disclosure of information by clinicians and researchers. They demand that it be fuller and more specific. All discussions of patient privacy focus narrowly on requirements to process medical data in prescribed ways unless those to whom the information pertains have consented. If we rely on these and the many other impersonal metaphors in this area, I think we miss a lot of things that are basic to communication between people and particularly to the transactions in which we request, give, and refuse consent. Now, that leads me to think that we need a picture. And here's a picture of informed consent as it is supposed to operate. It's rather nice, isn't it? Um, I think this is probably that I bought it from a, um, a sort of images thing on the web. Uh, but you can see, this is extremely nice and congenial. Here's the patient. He is fine. He is an autonomous person. He is wearing a suit. He's not in his pajamas. He is sitting there, seriously reading a difficult document. The physician, well, she's fine too. She's got a white coat, and she is uh, pointing out the finer points of this um, informed consent disclosure. It all looks as though it's happening uh, to a proper standard between professionals. Uh, and uh, you can also reflect a bit, if you like decoding images, on the background that you've got there. Uh, you see her office, it looks really uh, quite uh, nicely academic. She has a lot of very unread but buildings with <laughs> box with books with gold backs and you know, proper green light. It's all very proper. That's what's supposed to be happening according to the theory. As we all know, when you meet a contemporary informed consent form, it may be um, something like taking out a mortgage because it's going to be so complicated and have so many clauses and you've got to say yes and no and put your signature on so many things. In fact, it's the sort of thing that can be caricatured. And here's a caricature that I rather like. It is not entirely implausible, is it? <laughs> um, and uh, you probably, all of you have met that wonderful vocabulary in the sitcoms uh, where one doctor shouts across to another doctor in an emergency room context, have you consented her? And that transitive, that verb transitive, where A consents B, seems to me to reveal to us where practice uh, as it were, uh, has to pretend to meet impossible theory. Uh, it's not a very uh, edifying comment. Um, but I'm afraid philosophers, as I say, don't really do visual aids, but I thought that was a nice one. There aren't any more. Sorry about that. 
What could we do having reached the conclusion that um, we somehow have to find a way in between the pretense of the first illustration and the uh, satirical inadequacy of the second? I'm not quite sure, but let me try. I think what we need to begin by doing is recognizing that we need to think about informed consent in the context that communicative transactions are rationally evaluable social transactions between agents, including or consisting of speech acts, which are governed by a pretty rich normative framework, and they're going to fail if the relevant norms are ignored or flouting. At the moment, we're only talking about the communicative norms, the epistemic norms. Any convincing account of an informed consent transaction has to begin by being realistic about what it takes to communicate. The epistemic norms, such as in intelligibility, relevance to the actual audience, accuracy and honesty, will shape any successful use of informed consent transactions and must be observed if these are to be a way of justifying clinical or research interventions that would otherwise be unacceptable. So, point one, informed consent procedures cannot reach beyond the cognitive capacities of those who are asked to consent. It follows, often consent will have to be far from specific and far from explicit, where patients can't understand the full complexity of the procedures offered, they will have to consent or refuse on the basis of a limited view of what's going to be done and its likely outcomes. And where research subjects can't understand the research design, the randomized trial, for example, they'll have either to be excluded from research or allowed to participate without understanding the research methodology, the institutional affiliations, or the other complex matters that the Helsinki Declaration mentions. Now, this is the most philosophical bit, but it is quite short. Three, it's commonly said that what is at least necessary is that the consent procedures respect the autonomy of patients. That's a very fashionable justification. It sort of rolls across one's lips. One feels one said exactly the right thing. But I think that the thought that informed consent operationalizes autonomy is highly ambiguous. Let me explain. There are many different conceptions of autonomy running around, and it's not clear whether the, the ones that are attainable carry the necessary ethical weight, or the ones that carry the necessary ethical weight could be used. So the supposed consensus that informed consents the way we respect autonomy, and autonomy is a basic ethical value, is much more apparent than real because there's deep disagreement about conceptions of autonomy and their importance to ethics or to, to bioethics. Three are commonly invoked and commonly confused. One of them, which I think is the heavyweight conception, is the Kantian conception of principled autonomy. Fortunately, for this purpose, we can set it aside. Although it's mentioned with respect, because Kant's a big name to conjure with in my sort of world, it's hardly ever discussed in writing in medical and research ethics. Those who invoke Kant's legacy and authority overlook the fact that he uses the term autonomy not to refer to any characteristic of individual human beings, but to the formal property of principles of action that can serve for all, so specifically to the combination of law-like form, universal generalization for those who've done some logic, and universal scope. This understanding of autonomy is what makes sense of Kant's otherwise pretty odd claim that autonomy of the will is the sole principle of all moral laws and of duties in keeping with them. He did say that. But in speaking of autonomy of the will, he is thinking of, of this very specific property combining universal form and law-like scope. Of course he thinks that individual agents choose freely, but he doesn't think that's what makes their action autonomous in his sense of the term. Heteronymous action, the antithesis of Kantian autonomous action, heteronymously chosen action, is also freely chosen. Now contemporary writers have quite a different view. Many of them uh, think that 
uh, autonomy is a matter of individual autonomy, is a matter of mere sheer choice. And if they could show that this was ethically important, they'd be home and dry in a way, because um, then they would have said, well, all that matters is that the action be chosen. And um, then you have to say, but why is that ethically important? Years ago, when I was teaching in New York City, a student of mine um, was photographed running naked across Broadway with a lot of male students. So I said to her next time I met her, tell me, why did you do it? And she said, well, you see, they came out and they said, it's spring, it's spring, join us. And they all had their clothes off, so I took mine off and ran off with them. I said, but still, why did you do it? And she said, well, uh, how I felt it was the only way I could know I was autonomous. <laughs> uh, that rather set me back for a moment, but I'm certain she wasn't thinking of it being Kantianly autonomous. And... Uh, I suppose you might say it wasn't even terribly independent. Why did she need male initiative to take her clothes off? I don't know the answer. But that is the problem with thinking of autonomy as mere sheer choice. Not every mere choice seems to be a morally important choice. So thank you, Diane, across all these years. She's probably a respectable middle-aged lady now. Um, so other people think that it isn't really... Um, mere choice that counts, it is something more like reasoned choice. And reasoned or choice, rational choice, reflective choosing might be ethically rather more important. But even that probably wouldn't be the only thing that's important. But we probably couldn't show that it's fundamental to ethics, let alone to clinical or research ethics, only, if only because in those areas Choosing is cognitively very demanding and not all of us can rise to rational and reflective choosing in those contexts. And particularly when you're feeling terribly ill and frail or, or upset, it may be particularly hard. So it would be odd to say, well, the thing about informed consent procedures is that it allows the patient and the research subject to make a rational and reflective choice. And if that's not what he or she is making, then we shouldn't go ahead or we should find some other procedure. It would certainly limit the importance of um, uh, the or, uh, protecting or respecting autonomy. In short, if we think of autonomy as mere choice, we need some arguments to show why all choices, however irrational, however poorly informed, should be protected and respected. Because mere independence, we might plausibly think, can produce Choices and acts that are good or bad, right or wrong, kind or callous, prudent or risky. So it need further arguments. If, on the other hand, we think of it as reasoned and reflective choice, we need, still need arguments to show why only these choices should be protected. And it's going to be hard to show that actual consent, so often less than rational, so often less than reflective, operationalizes this interpretation of autonomy. Now, I think there are more concrete, traditional, and convincing ways of justifying the use of informed consent requirements, because we can use them to waive specific ethical, legal, or other rights, obligations, and prohibitions in particular cases. But they therefore presuppose whichever rights, obligations, or prohibitions are to be waived. For example, if I consent to have my appendix out, I agree to a specific and limita limited waiver of the surgeon's obligation to respect my bodily integrity. Generally, it's wrong to cut holes in people. But on the other hand, if I want my appendix out, then I waive that obligation in a particularly and uh, limited way. If I agree to join a clinical tri trial, I agree to a specific and limited waiver of the researcher's obligation not to encourage me to swallow drugs of unknown efficacy. But it's quite limited. I don't agree to accept just any drug that he, he, uh, he might offer me, just this one, this trial, and so on. So I think the Nuremberg Code may not have been so wide of the mark when it suggested that the voluntary consent of the research subject is needed to ensure that there is no element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, etc. 
it is needed to permit limited waivers of highly significant underlying obligations. Informed consent is therefore not fundamental to bioethics, to medical ethics, or to research ethics. It is something that always presupposes a complicated set of obligations and rights. And there's a further area in which informed consent has become important. Not only can properly used informed consent render action permissible, which would otherwise constitute, for example, assault or false imprisonment or deception or poisoning, it can also be used in a helpful way, I think, to think about informational obligations. Now, contemporary discussion of informational obligations uh, is often focused on categories like information privacy or informational privacy, genetic privacy, data protection, and rights to know. These assume, or these discussions assume, that informed consent is the key for dealing not only with potentially invasive interventions, as in uh, clinical treatment or in medical research, but with potentially intrusive informational activities. And there's a huge range of debates about such intrusive activities. Let us gesture to the word data protection. I'll come back to that in a moment. There's a second range of debates about informational obligations, which claims that certain sort of information isn't private, but on the contrary, it's public. And here the requirement is that it not be subjected to informed consent requirements. So we are in a culture at present in which information is seen as divisible into the intrinsically private to be brought under data protection legislation and intrinsically public to be brought under freedom of information legislation. Nice idea. But the, both debates and, and both bodies of legislation assume that certain types of informational content can be picked out and, as it were, quarantined or corralled. The first debate assumes that personal information, including genetic information and medical information, has intrinsic distinctive ethical importance. Such information is seen as information that nobody else other than the data subject has a right to know, which should be kept inaccessible from others unless the data subject gives informed consent to disclosure. On the other hand, current debates and legislation view that the information that is thought of as institutional or professional, or about professional performance or public, is information everybody has, else has the right to know, which should be disclosed to the wider public in the name of accountability, freedom of information, and transparency without any informed consent requirements. However, privacy obligations aren't very easily understood as rights over putative classes of informational content or as obligations to handle putative classes of informational content in distinctive ways. Now, I say putative classes of informational content because one thing we know about informational content, the content of speech acts, is that information does not come in discrete classes. It is inferentially fertile which is simply to say that what you can infer on the basis of knowing one piece of information depends entirely on what else you know. I think it's time for a good funny story that I heard in Norway last week. Um, old priest, um, 50th anniversary of his, his ordination, and he's sitting there with his friends saying, oh, you know, it was very hard when I was first ordained, and the first confession I heard, this chap confessed to a murder. And I really didn't know what I should do or uh, how I should absolve him or what penance I should give him. At which point, another friend of the priest's rushes in late and said, Father so-and-so, I'm so glad to see you, so sorry I'm late. Uh, and turns to everybody and said, do you know, I was the first person whose confession he heard when he was ordained. <laughs> now that gives you an immediate idea about how inferential fertility works, or for those of you who do some philosophy, referential opacity is the, the um, topic underneath all this. But for sort of some concrete examples, a doctor is often able to infer something about a person's health, seeing him in a social or public context. It's not so uncommon. Um, or a person with a, who has a DNA test, 
may discover something about his or her own DNA which permits a highly probable inference about somebody else's DNA. It's not so uncommon. So unqualified rights to know or rights not to know specific items of personal medical or genetic information are absurd. They offer no way of dealing with the reality that information is variably inferentially fertile depending on the other information held. So there's no way of corralling specific types of propositional or informational content or showing that they are intrinsically private. Information about a person's home address is regarded as personal information in some contexts, e.g. in the doctor's office. But, of course, in other contexts it's public, in the electoral register. So genetic information and medical information and other personal information is not intrinsically private or exceptional. If we are able to protect privacy, and I would think we should in some cases, it will be trying, but not by trying to argue that putative classes of propositional or informational content are no-go areas, but by prohibiting certain types of speech act, for example, those that breach confidentiality. So attempts to define privacy as rights over content lead to incoherence, and I believe this incoherence is well manifested in the data protection legislation under which we suffer. Since we cannot quarantine categories of information, we can't define informational rights and obligations as rights and obligations over specifiable types of information. Attempts to do so are going to fail, and they're also sometimes going to lead us in a precautionary way to draw far too wide a cordon around such information. Consider, for example, the damage that data protection legislation does to work in epidemiology and public health. I believe we do much better to define obligations on speech acts rather than obligations over the content of speech acts. A coherent approach to informational obligations will look at obligations to perform or refrain from types of speech <coughs> act. For example, there may be obligations to respond accurately to inquiries, or obligations of confidentiality, or obligations to give others an account of one's performance, and so on. Respect for privacy is best understood in these terms as respect for the confidentiality uh, uh, for confidentiality in some communicative transactions. Respect for accountability is best understood in terms of duties to make certain information available to certain others to communicate information. When we misconstrue informational obligations as a matter of keeping information hidden from all others or making it available from all others, there's real danger of adopting policies <coughs> which do no good and which damage and for which no justification can be given. If we accepted that informational obligations must be construed as obligations to achieve epistemically and ethically acceptable communication, I think there's at least a chance of doing better. This, I believe, might have a number of quite practical implications. I'll give you six. I think healthcare institutions could stop trying to implement ever more rigorous and numerous informed consent requirements and could remove requirements that are either dysfunctional or unjustifiable or both. They could do it promptly too. I think research funders could stop funding work that is aimed at supposedly improving consent procedures to make them fit for unachievable purposes and they could stop demanding the use of procedures that cannot or need not be used and which encourage a whole culture of pretense that genuine consent has been given. I think that the manuals and procedures for research ethics committees could be rewritten to ensure that the point and limits of informed consent and the standards it can meet are feasible and that they're set out clearly, and I think that the committees could work hard to deter inflationary, unjustifiable, and frequently absurd elaborations of these requirements. I think regulators could insist that it's communication to relevant audiences and not mere disclosure and dissemination that matters. 
and that they could judge medical and research performance partly in these terms and not by compliance with informed consent protocols up to which ordinary people and even extraordinary people cannot live. I think that data protection legislation could be reviewed and reformed with the aim of supporting justifiable, defensible rather than illusory notions of privacy. I think patient support groups could insist on accountability that supports rather than undermines the intelligent placing and refusal of trust by patients. These are only a few suggestions, but the, they are based on the view that it's time we gave up the Sisyphean task of trying to work out a Helsinki-style conception of informed consent and time we turn to setting out a realistic and ethically defensible justification of informed consent practices. Thank you. You've been listening to a special lecture vodcast from Imperial College London.